Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 347. That's 347. 347. How are you guys doing? How are you guys feeling? Amazing, great. Um, how am I? Pretty good. I'm still haircutless. I'm still um, grubby looking. You know what I kind of look like now I've kind of thought about it a little bit more? You know those little portraits that you find of um, Roman scholars and intellectuals uh, and philosophers from back in the day or leaders, right? That's what I kind of look like. Those kind of pictures where, you know, they just got hair and beard. They sort of keep them a little bit more trimmed than I do, but just in, in excess mass of hair and beard. So I do feel a little bit more, which how do I say, um, dare I say intelligent with this haircut and beard assembly. But hey, what can we do? What can we do? It's a decision I've made with my life and I'm going to stick with it. Hope you guys are fine wherever you are, whether you're tuning into this, whether via YouTube or via the podcast app. Of course, if you're listening via the podcast app, make sure you leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friends. If you're watching the show via YouTube, smash that like button down below, click subscribe, leave me a comment as well if you don't mind. And if you want to support the show for as little as one dollar to make sure I keep recording these episodes and get them out to you as quick as possible. And of course, for you to gain um, access to the audio version of the podcast at least three days ahead of when it comes out anywhere else, please sign up to my patreon that is patreon.com forward slash agostino that's patreon.com forward slash a g o s t i n h o for as little as one dollar per month you can get access to my entire art library of podcasts and also the podcast come out three days ahead of time for all you patreon subscribers um what else has been happening, man? So much stuff is going on, right? i got a lot of stuff in the show to get through, a lot of interesting topics to dig on deep, from entitled travellers to stuff about Dan Bozerian to stuff about fashion to some other bits and pieces I've seen about culture. You know, you know what the deal is. You know what the deal is. So lock in, lock tight, grab yourself a nice cold beverage or a warm one if you're that kind of person, right? Do those people exist? People that purposely put their drinks in between their legs so that it gets warm or it gets close to body temperature and then drink that. Like, you know, th th that person does exist, right? The person that doesn't like their water chilled. They prefer their water to sit outside somewhere in the direct sun heat or in the direct sunlight. Like I have, um, you know, it's quite sunny now at the moment. So if I was to put my glass on the window still over there, right? Would some people actually prefer that? Like, oh yeah, I, I don't like my water cold. It hurts my teeth. That person must exist, right? People that moan about everything. I'm sure that kind of person isn't going to be, isn't going to feel that embarrassed about moaning about their water being too cold. So yeah, um, regardless of what kind of person you are, grab your beverage, grab your drink and sit down and tune in, lock on with me for this jam-packed action show that I have for you today. So you're going to get right on into it, right? Something that I thought about and something I've been mulling over a little bit just in terms of what's going on with, you know, COVID and all that sort of stuff and entertainment industry and nightlife and all that stuff because I'm interested in it in community, right? I DJ myself, right? I've DJed myself for the best part of, what, 10 plus years. I was promoter for maybe five years. I was probably one of the hardest jobs I've done. I'm not going to lie. Trying to get people to go to a venue that doesn't have because that's one thing people don't really understand about promoting if you once you get into it and you actually work if you really want when you get into it for the love cool i'd appreciate the music that's fair enough but then you slowly but surely realize that the places that you're going to that are just you know the, the kind of entry level places where you go and promote are usually the the clubs and venues that have already established a bit of a following and for some time <coughs> and you could be led to believe that it's a bit plug and play so it's really hard to judge how successful you were in your promoting and how much it had to do with just the club being or the venue itself being popping. So once you've built up a bit of steam, you've built a bit of a re reputation for yourself, um, you've obviously got a good clientele, a good customer base, you then want to maybe branch out in the hopes of maybe breaking even or dare I say making some money. And also because you want to test yourself and see where do I actually lay on the, where am I actually on the promoter totem pole, right? Um, how, f um, how much work have i actually done how much better people are to my brand do they actually love what i'm doing all these sort of questions come into your head so you kind of want to prove it to yourself that you're actually as good as you think you are then you go out and you you know you uh, hire a venue somewhere where you have to kind of hire you have to you hire a venue then you have to hire all the equipment for a venue that doesn't have any you know um equipment in there and then you slowly but surely realize oh i'm not as big of a deal as i thought i was right 
and then you have to start from scratch again so you have like two kind of phases of your promoter journey you have the phase where you're sort of plugging and playing in bars and clubs then you have the phase of your promoter journey where you're essentially going to random places and trying to make those things as successful as your previous venues and it's so difficult you do not understand how difficult it is to get people out of their homes to a venue that they're not heard about to listen to play people that they don't really care about which then goes to explain why as much as i know the dj community especially um techno twitter they they can get a bit annoyed at the fact that places like awakenings places like i don't know whatever else of a festival that goes ade they can get annoyed that they only book the same people year in year out part of the reason or most of the reason the majority of the reason is because those people sell tickets right they put bums in seats uh, for lack of a better term and that is so rare to find especially nowadays where everyone's really concentrating or bothering about social media it's proper difficult to find people who are on the come up who obviously have a pop in social media but also are able to get people out of their homes it's not easy so when you do find them you're just going to hold on tight especially if they're in their infancy you're going to make sure you want to be part of their journey so all that to be said um there's obviously been a really big prevalence this it feels like there's been a bit of a sea change in terms of electronic music space or the the entertainment industry in general right it's been completely decimated by covid people have been suffering left right and center and um you're obviously because that industry is gone right for the most part any mass gatherings you're not allowed to have them so a lot of these people's income has essentially been slashed to if not half if not most of their income is completely gone and if they haven't diversifies their income stream because they didn't think they needed to right if they didn't have any other way of getting any kind of money then they're definitely hurting right now even if they've got productions that are selling you know people are probably not buying tunes as much as they were in previously because they don't have much disposable income so every point of their income stream is being disrupted by some way shape or form but a lot of these people that are complaining especially some of the bigger artists you sometimes scratch your head and you think to yourself how are you complaining when you play at some of the best festivals in the world, you obviously get paid, let's say, don't count anyone's pockets, but let's say they're getting paid 10 grand per set, right? Or per appearance. It makes you think like, if you were smart enough, especially if you come from the ground up and you've worked in bars and pubs like I have, you would be aware of just how little you can earn. And if you're at the, you know, at the pinnacle of the mountain you'd also be appreciative of how much you're earning now and be like hell i'm gonna make sure that i save some of this because this is never guaranteed because i know where i'm coming from right? i know i've been you know djing let's say for lack of a better reference you've been djing at fucking you know hocks and bar and grill for the best part of six years and suddenly now you're playing the big festivals you know what it is to be fighting over 150 pounds to play in some pub where no one cares about you being there then suddenly going to a festival where you're getting paid you're gonna make sure you look after that money you'd imagine so right so one of the things i've been really disturbed by is seeing all these really successful um by the looks of it affluent djs who are trying their best to basically push events to go on to happen people to mass gather in the hopes that they can play out again mostly because it seems like they don't have any other income coming in but i'm thinking why do they have anything saved which made me think about the story about dan bozerian right so i'm sure you're familiar with who dan bozerian is he's essentially the idol of 13 year olds on instagram all around the world um <coughs> he's on there floating his cash floating his access to really hot and attractive women who he has to who he essentially hires it looks like to travel a world around him and um, some of them of course i'm sure use that platform of dan bozerian to kind of boost their own profile um he has access to all these rich influential people you know it's all it's the kind of glitzy show life that if you were a teenager or if you're approaching your teenage years, I wouldn't be angry at you for thinking that this is something to be um, heralded and something to be like, you know, respected. And think, oh, wow, I can aim for something like this, right? Because on paper, he's living that kind of um, rock star lifestyle that a lot of those kids would want to live without actually having, you know, of course, rock star lifestyle, you know, you are led to believe that you have to have some kind of musical talent. But if you just want to be a, a social media public figure, um, Dan Bozerian is probably the best example of that. And maybe it can be some kind of role model to those kind of kids, right? <clears throat> Don't get me wrong, I don't agree with it, but if you dash your intention of life, then why not look at someone like Dan Brazilian? But for the longest time, a lot of people have been thinking, this story doesn't make sense, right? It, did, it just didn't make sense that somebody that would play poker, admittedly, get rich off that, and that somehow was able to sustain the lifestyle he has just off um, the riches that he's assumed from playing poker. It just didn't add up to him, right, right? And if you spend any time on the internet, if you spend any time reading books of successful people, um whether they're successful in business or yeah whether successful in business whatever you know avenue it may be usually the way to attain wealth or the way to uh sustain that level of of flagrancy that level of um 
you know, materialism, that level of spending, you need to have something that you're selling or a service you're providing. You just can't do it purely based off of like um, one off winnings of some game that you played. It just isn't doesn't make any sense. So a lot of people have been kind of, you know, f um, guessing that maybe he's a trust fund kid. There's a wealthy backer behind him putting money into his account, blah, blah, blah. blah. But we didn't know how far it went until this article came out from Forbes, right? And Forbes were the first people to break this. So Forbes initially broke the story that Dan Bozarian may not be as rich as he essentially claims um, based on the fact that his business, Ignite, the CBD company that he's got that was, I think, started off as a weed company, then went into CBD. They're essentially been uh, losing, I think, 50 million, I don't know, dollars, let's say, over the year or something stupid like that, right? They've just been absolutely burning through money. And that lawsuit then also led to the fact that one of their former presidents, um, decided to sue um, Ignite Dan Bozarian's company for wrongful um, dismissal and defamation because he basically blew the whistle on the fact that Dan Bozarian, instead of spending the money that he allegedly earned from his poker days, was charging all of his expenses to the company card. Which goes to show you that, quite admittedly, his lifestyle, even though there might be some aspects of it that are legitimate, all in all, it means that he wasn't necessarily living the life. He, the, live, the lifestyle he was planning portraying wasn't necessarily correct, wasn't necessarily right. It didn't was necessarily the truth, and that led me to think about the DJs that were complaining about the performances because I feel as if a lot of these people, especially when I read this article later, but a lot of these artists, a lot of these people in the entertainment industry or in this nightlife scene, it seems like they weren't able. They kind of purport to be. Um, you know, uh, savvy businessmen, but for the looks of it, all of these people are renting. They're all renting, they're all leasing places, uh, airplanes, cars, whatever it may be. And those things add up and they don't have any kind of um, assets that they can sell or that they can liquidate to allow them to have more cash to sustain themselves during these times. So effectively, all these high rollers are in the same position that you and I are in, right? Where we essentially are having to work maybe for, you know, a decreased amount of wages in order to kind of keep the lights on or we're having to sell some of our assets in terms of, you know, making in order to have some money coming in or we're in a way or we're living a lifestyle where we're essentially having to rent most of our stuff right from my mobile phone contract to the apartment i live in those things are formed you know kind of the bedrock of my day-to-day -day. those are things that i'm essentially leasing so those people that you know kind of shit on you and make you feel like you're nothing are exactly like you and i maybe they're not working maybe they're not working for a man but they're still living paycheck to paycheck they're still renting the things that, you know, we are renting, homes, mobile phones. Um, they're still kind of paying out of pocket for holidays and stuff. And some of the stuff that I'll read on to you later on this article, you'll be like, Jesus Christ, the amount of spending is just, you know, out of this world, especially considering, you know, what's happening in the world at the moment. I'm assuming some of these avenues of income will slow down or what's happening in general, right? There's only so long you can continue spending outspending the things that you're actually making but it's just a really eye-opening story so it's just from Forbes it says Dan Bozerian is a renter and someone else pays his credit card now of course they're being a bit spicy with the headline I think these guys are at gloating at Dan Bozerian's demise which I'm not I still think he's pretty interesting dude um to sort of like observe from the outside I think he plays an integral part in society whether he's a cautionary tale or a point of people to just basically you know form some essays around I think he's a fascinating figure in general so I'm not happy that he's losing money or that he might end up being bankrupt I just think it's an interesting case study as to how these sort of self-proposed I don't know I think they call self-help groups or whatever they are these lifestyle gurus who kind of purport to be one thing but they're when the truth is uncovered it's actually quite closer to home right so it continues it says um it's from um forbes he says um the mansions the yachts the parties the models how does dan bozerian the globe trotting cash stocking gun toting instagram boasting party playboy do it or more to the point how does he pay for it all According to a lawsuit file this week, he doesn't. Dan Brazarian rents his homes and charges the rest of his six-figure lifestyle to a credit card that someone else pays off, which is probably the most interesting part of it. Fair enough, he rents, but I wonder who's a, who's that wealthy benefactor. Is it somebody that's involved in, I don't know, is that like a criminal underworld person? Is that somebody involved in a foreign intelligence service? Or is that just his wealthy backer that has just always remained behind the scenes that's just kind of living indiscriminately through him? Or is it the person that's kind of always pictured off the camera? because you've always wondered right imagine this table here a picture of these everyone sitting on the table there's obviously somebody sitting here maybe it was a girl or maybe it was one of the wealthy benefactors that's kind of always out of shot similar to those kind of instagram baddies that go to you know saudi arabia and dubai to get a new body done or to get shit all over their chest and then the guy that actually calling them or send them over 
is completely, you know, it doesn't want anything to do with social media. Maybe that's part of it. Who knows? It continues. It says, um, the lease on his home in the Ritzy Los Angeles Hills, for example, is £200,000 a month. Dan Bozerian does not pay his rent. So, that is kind of similar to the thing that's going on at the moment in the Fire and the Kid community or in the Joe Rogan podcasting sphere, right? Where a lot of the fans of Joe Rogan are kind of ragging on Brendan Shaw from the Fire and the Kid because he went out to do comedy, caught COVID, and since then has been really kind of, um, how do you say, has been sort of... Um, he sort of doubled down on his stance that COVID is just a flu. If you get it, 99% of people will be okay, blah, blah, blah. But part of his motivation to go out, if you're someone like a Brendan Shaw, is going to be because your entire lifestyle is rented, right? You don't actually own most of the things that you have. Whether or not you have a business that you run and he's got a couple of successful podcasts or a few of them anyway, um, I'm sure he does, you know, he's got a salary coming in from Showtime, blah, blah. Loads of good stuff happening in his life. But if you're renting, especially at that scale, at that level, it only makes sense when you have a constant flow of income or of opportunities coming your way. So the amount of your rent, you just won't matter. Do you know what I mean? I think it's similar to these, you know, um, artists and stuff, right? These um, rappers who basically boast about their kind of uh, fees that they get when they go to shows, partly because they know they're just going to blow. You know, if you get 100000 per an appearance, you're just going to blow the 100000 like it's £10 because you know you're going to get it next week. But once those events stop... Um, it then becomes a little bit harder to justify paying, you know, 200000 for an apartment somewhere in the Hollywood Hills. It doesn't, it's not going to work out no matter how much you're earning, no matter how much you're, no matter how much you're making, you're always going to be at some level of a deficit, really, because, you know, you're trying to, you're, you're basically outspending how much you're basically making, which is nuts, really, to think of that. And you just would expect somebody of the, I don't know, maybe, I mean, maybe, um, a bit ignorant or naive in that respect but i would expect somebody of his level of wealth to have access to some really smart business managers or people that could help him out to maybe buy some things that he could essentially use as assets to make some money for him whether they're homes office buildings whether it's investing in a sure bet startup i don't know there's, there's obviously avenues that he could do that could allow him to be self-sufficient somewhere rather than not. But after reading the four hour work week and what basically Tim Ferriss was basically cautioning against all those, all those years back in the day, but I don't know, maybe the four hour work week title was a bit triggering. But if you think about it, the four hour work week um, premise around the idea of being lifestyle um, of, of having a, sorry designing your own lifestyle and being um in the what's it called? time independent i forgot what that may be right where you're basically you're trying to frame your lifestyle in a way where you're not dependent on always working based on always making money based on the amount of time you're working so you essentially when you're sleeping whatever you've invested in the business that you started is able to make you money while you sleep but you're also constant of the idea of making sure you diminish your outgoing so whether it's you know working remotely somewhere in southeast asia whether it's hiring um, um, virtual uh, PAs or people working abroad. Well, it's kind of like the same model that Kaya Jenner has with her cosmetics brands, right? Where you kind of have this whole cosmetics empire and you only have five full-time employees and everyone else is outsourced. So that was the whole premise behind it. And I remember at the time everyone was like, oh, this is stupid. No, you have to work 17 hours a day. Blah, blah, blah. Right? He got ragged on quite a bit. But if you think about it, really, it's quite a sound advice. Because you could be Dan Brazone if you wanted to, but you just would have to decrease the unnecessary bits of spending, right? Like the private jets and the tanks and stuff. You could obviously do it, but it would take a it would take a it would take a bit of um, savviness to kind of get it done. But which obviously Dan Brazone doesn't seem to have or doesn't really care for. It continues says um, the house, the everything else, the models, the flights, the yachts is charged to a corporate tab at ignite international limited the company the brazilian founded and serves as ceo and majority shareholder according to cartis hefferman ignites recently outed former president paying dan brazilian 2.5 million annual rent and paying everything else dan brazilian does was would be an explanation for how ignite managed to lose a report with 50 million a year uh, last year as Forbes was reported so imagine his Ignite company which looks a bit shitty to begin with anyway but fair enough he's trying to do something right he's trying to leave some sort of positive imprint or trying to make some think of the amounts of wealth and privilege or opportunities been given that's a that's a definitely something to be heralded but you know it's already struggling as it is because there's a million and one CBD weed companies out there in the US who are trying to kind of, you know, gain some steam before it, it becomes, before it gets legalized nationwide. They're all trying to kind of, you know, they're all trying to carve their own lane. But it didn't seem that special to me. So on top of that, you're then charging 
all your expenses, all your flagrant trips and all that stuff that you're doing. Or maybe he's kind of overly charging it and being a little bit cheeky and adding, you know, we, we, we've all done it. You work in the office sometimes and you might add a couple bits more, you know, maybe a, a meal that you're not meant to add to your expense list. You're going to add it on there, but it's usually forgiven, right? But you don't go as far as charging, you know, the hiring of uh, models from far flung places on the earth to go hang out with you to your company card or a mansion that is got no other purpose from you just hanging out with your friends and you know smashing loads of blondes you can't really do that to the company card that's not really on it that's really taking a piss and he continues says um and according to Effman's suit complaining about Dan Brazilian's addiction to spending company money and objecting or to uh, various sleight of hand tricks that would hide his expenses are what got him fired. Um, through his co through his company counsel, Ignite did not respond to a request or comment. In a statement issued by TMZ, Brazilian denied the allegation in Efferman's suit and vowed to counter suit. Um, however, Ignite's employees who spoke on condition of anonymity, fearing of the personal replications, uh, confirmed of much of Hefferman's claimed of the suit. It said Ignite pays for everything, one said. Models, events, he yachts and dan would just have it wrapped in the ignite logo and all of a sudden it was an ignite expense and he would send them all the bill that is some scumbag marketing tricks and i've been in marketing teams before where people have kind of suggested the same sort of thing right where they've maybe co-opted someone's uh, campaign and slapped their logo on it or just went to take advantage of it through sales whatever right but that is some flagrant stuff man imagine doing an event at Coachella that has nothing to do with your company and suddenly just slapping your logo on it because you happen to be there which maybe is part of the problem which maybe that's the wisdom of having separate themselves from their business right they can do something that's completely div divorced from what they do independently in their own life that's really really important but imagine the same thing could be said for conducts business or how they treat the employees can quite easily kind of separate them can kind of separate bezos the man and amazon the business right you don't need to kind of but once you are a pretty divisive figure in yourself and then you have a business that you're sort of linking you're trying to leverage your fame you're trying to leverage yeah your fame to the business um success it can also backfire because when people don't like you they're gonna you also tar your business with the same brush as well so that's maybe happening in this extent so you don't really know it says here continue it said Events that had nothing to do with the business. Hefferman is seeking uh, damages for defamation, wrongful termination, and also for being intimidated, uh, terminated in violation of California state whistleblower protection laws. Hefferman, a former executive of the Procter and Gamble, joined Ignite on March 18, 2019. At the time, the company was trying to find its niche. Ignite pivoted from recreational cannabis brand to a CBD company to a company that was happy to try to put the Ignite logo on just about anything. Fair, fair enough to Hefferman, but imagine leaving Procter and Gamble to go and work for somebody like a Dan Bozzeri. That's not a sound business decision, really, is it? Because obviously, there's the idea that it could become. If you, if you want, maybe again, if you got fired, it's a different thing. But if you purposely left Procter and Gamble to go work with Dan Bozzeri, it's like you're obviously hoping he's a one in a million success. Because of it, business already, it's difficult, right? Doesn't matter if you've got funds. Doesn't matter if you've got access to people. Starting a business whether you're rich or you're poor, is flipping this incredibly difficult. Making a successful business is one, you know, it's a one in a million shot. So he was hoping that Dan Brazilian, on top of being a very divisive public figure, was also going to be very successful in a market that's already super, super cl um, uh, cluttered, right? It's super crowded, the cannabis and CBD company, CBD industry. We don't really have the thing here because obviously can cannabis isn't legal in the UK, but the CBD world has already got mad amount of people in it, right? Even the vape lounges, there's so many places popping up all over the place. So to try and bet your, you know, your life's work on this guy was a really, really bad move in, in retrospect. It has to be said, in it? Come on, man. It continued here, says, uh, <laughs> working out of a WeWork, Hefferman earned 275000 a year as vice president of sales. According to his suit, he became acting president of Ignite in November and after the exit of his predecessor, John McCormick, a former tobacco executive. I was talking about somebody the other day, right? But I was saying that more like, a, how often have you been to, I don't know, just right. How often have you been to, how often have you worked for a company or got a new job and the person that you're replacing left, but you don't really know why they left? And most of the time, I say, let's say eight out of 10 times, usually the reason why they left was valid. 
and you usually realize quite quickly why they left like whether it's you know a tyrannical boss um and what's it what's the thing called um unreasonable work expectations or whatever right there's always something that's gone on before but it's hard to actually find out because no one's going to talk to you that person that you know left prior you probably you might not meet them you might get a virtual handover. Uh, they might not be willing to kind of be open because they don't know if you're going to snitch. It, there's loads of things going on in there, but it's always a bit of an issue that anyway, when you walk into a company to replace somebody, um, you always feel as if in the back of your head, there's probably a reason why this person left, isn't it? A legitimate one. And you felt the power there. But imagine earning 275000 working out of a fucking WeWork. Mad, isn't it? That's the thing that makes WeWork so interesting. In the same building... Where there's, you know, companies, you know, one company doing a shitty startup, one company doing a good startup. There's such a disparity in the pay in startups. It's just awful, right? They have interns working for 16000 a year, and then the person above you is making forty two. It's like, you know, come on, man. Let's have some incremental salary steps at least. You know what I mean? Um, he says, continues here. Says, Trouble arose in May 2020. Red flags were first raised by accountants doing the books in preparation for Ignite International uh, Brand Annual Report, reported by the Canadian Stock Exchange. According to the suit, the accounts flagged 843,000 in company expenses that appear to be personal in nature. Just imagine, just a million pounds of company expenses like a million dollars sorry that is insane bruv um these included payments for charges racked up on one of dan brazilian's credit cards a half a million dollar yacht rental a six-figure two-night trip to london imagine spending that much to go to, oh my god sixty-five thousand four elements guns and star wars set a fifty-five thousand fifty thousand pound bed frame which maybe you know he probably needed probably gets a lot of use out of that bed you know if, if you if you believe what you read on the internet um uh, 75,000 paintball field and 80, uh, 88,000 pound vault, a for $88,000 vault to name but a few. The company also paid 26,000 to boost uh, Belzerian's Instagram followers and paid for travel expenses of the rotating cast of models that permanently accompany Belzerian wherever he goes, the suit claims. Brother, brother, this guy still pays for Instagram followers. This is insane. Now, I I don't believe this was a fact though i think that the, the higher up you are the more it seems the, the the bigger you are as a celebrity the more beneficial it is for you to buy instagram followers right because the assumption is that if you've got a million it's very difficult to gauge maybe it's not if you look at the ratios you can probably tell by likes and followers but if you're not savvy to all that stuff it's probably high easier to hide adding an extra 10,000 followers on your instagram page via paid services as opposed to doing it when you're just a nobody so I've long believed that's the case. And also people don't realize just how, um, um, how, uh, how much of a, what, how kind of benefits you monetarily to buy Instagram followers, especially if you're a celebrity, the amount of endorsements you could get, the amount of brand deals you could get, the amount of exposure it could give you, the amount that I'm sure some studio executives probably look at people's Instagram followers and decide who to bet on in terms of who to go for when they're deciding on who's, who's going to get the role ultimately, especially if it comes down to two people that are maybe closely matched or closely um, yeah, our matching skill set. Maybe the deciding factor is who's got the biggest exposure, who can get us more retweets, who can get us more shares. So I'm not surprised by that, but imagine spending twenty six thousand pounds worth, mate, on Instagram followers. That is mad, isn't it? It's so for twenty six thousand dollars. Sorry, I keep saying pounds. Bloody hell, man. Um, Heffman also pressured by other company executives and members of the Ignite board to sign off on expenses that Ignite's business charges he claims suspecting fraud according to the suit Heffman tried to convince Bazarian to at least dump 20, 200,000 a month mentioned because after all the COVID-19 pandemic is hitting South Carolina sorry South, Car South California hard um, how can you have splashy marketing events with social distancing requirements he says at that point the suit claims Bazarian jumped in as chairman of the board and said I'm going to do something summer I'm going to do some summer um, pool parties and will utilize the house. The next day, Bazarian accused Hefferman of doing drugs during a company meeting, according to the suit, and fired him on June 8th. That is a that is even madman. Uh, the annual report uh, showing Ignite staggering losses and also showing the companies um, involving uh, Ignite shareholders on the board members loaned the company cash to keep it afloat was made public on the Canadian Stock Exchange website about a week later. Hefferman did not respond to a call for comment in a statement to his attorney. Tamara Free said that the client looks forward to his day in court. Will it get that far? That may depend on what Dan Bazarian, who employees describe as almost a fanatically image conscious, decides he's comfortable with the public knowing or how much balance is left on his credit card to pay the lawyers bloody hell 
So he's a fraud. To, again, not fraud fully, because there's parts of his story that are obviously true. But definitely the parts that people were kind of calling out, the idea that he basically made his, most of his um, wealth from poker isn't true because anybody that's going to... Because I, I, I don't know. Because it could be argued. If he's willing to sign off all his expenses to his company card, it could mean he doesn't have any of his own money to spend. Or it could just mean that he's taking advantage of the fact that he's got a company card and everyone does it, right? Because I remember working for a company where one of the ladies I was working for... She was very, very loose and very. She was very loose and very happy to slap the company card just about anything she she did, right? Um, whether it was a lunch, a dinner, whatever, she slapped on the company card. And then, of course, some staff members took the piss of that. But most of the time, she was doing it all the time. Like any any time she was in the office, the company paid for her food basically. Um, and that happens quite often. So maybe in his head, he's just doing the he's just doing what everyone else around him is doing, but at a higher level. Maybe, I don't know. But it's bloody interesting to see in it. So let's see how that story kind of rolls out. But I thought that was interesting one to start off with. Let's get going. What else is on the list? Um, we are not destined to be rich and talented. Oh, yeah, this is an interesting one. So this is regarding um, a short one regarding Logic. Logic has obviously been going on a bit of a... No, he stopped, man. He did a bit of press concerning his album, No Pressure, and basically detailing the reason why he essentially stepped away from the limelight and why he decided this will be his last album. People like myself are a bit skeptical of it. I think the fact that he stopped, he stopped more so because he wasn't necessarily respected by his peers. Um, his artistry wasn't that greatly appreciated. And instead of trying to fight for relevance, not relevancy, instead of trying to um, convince people otherwise, he just decided to bow out gracefully, which is okay, right? But I also think, you know, let's not kind of lie about the idea that, you know, being as talented or being as talented as he thinks he is, but also not having the respect of your peers is going to do something to you. That is something that you just can't deny. I don't think anyone can deny that. And I think this interview here from... Oh, what's up? I don't like this interview here, can you hear me? Yep, yep, can you hear me? Can you hear me? This, yep, yep, can you hear me? Yeah, cool. This interview here from DJ, well, no, this interview here from, where is it from? This guy called Hard Knock Something that I found on Twitter from the, the editor in chief at DJ Booth sort of um, excused the reasons why he basically effectively decided to um, hang up his microphone more so than the fact that he feels like, you know, uh, his work is not... I don't know. Yeah, this is probably the real reason why he basically decided to retire, I think. Let me get out for you here. Boom. The same, the same internet that I fell in love with and how I would engage with fans is not the same that it is today. So for me spending a decade to go on my phone and talk to fans, but I can't do that anymore because when I go on my phone, I've hit a level that's just loved or hated. And so I could literally, I mean, it happens all the time. It's like I go and I'll be like, I love you guys. And somebody's like, faggot. And I'm just like, yo, how can you just say this and nothing happens to you? Like, that's crazy to me, dog. And they'll shit on me and it's going to happen. They're going to call my baby ugly and they've already shit on my wife and made accounts and called her ugly, you know, and this whole thing. It's like, it's crazy. It's insane. But if you just put it out of your mind, it's okay. So that's why I was went to this happy place. Not to sit here and talk too much about negative shit. So that's basically the real reason why he decided to hang up his mic. And I guess it's, it's, it's legitimate as well because I've, I've long believed that I don't think... I think fame, especially fame that you uh, that we kind of all grew up on, right? The fame of like the Brad Pitts and Leonardo DiCaprio was something very envi enviable prior to social media. We were like, wow, this is amazing. Everyone knows your name. You're in front of magazines. You're going to red carpet events and stuff. Um, but then as soon as social media came around and then we had the advent of people like, you know, reality TV stars became famous, which were essentially, quote unquote, normal everyday people got some level of fame and you saw what they went through you saw people dying you saw people hanging themselves you saw people being families broken up just the complete devastation on the other side of fame it made people realize oh there's actually a talent and actually a skill or there's actually a temperament that allows somebody to willingly go into that field knowing what it's going to do to their life and what it's going to do to their family what it's going to do to their mental health it's something that you have to purposely decide that you're willing to do and the consequences are can be catastrophic really can and i think what we've seen with social media the good part of it i think is it's exposed what actually being famous is actually really like right if you only go, if you go to someone that you love and appreciate who's at the pinnacle of their field or is that the uh, you know the forefront of their field and you read through some of their comments especially if they're a little bit devices you're like wow 
this is a lot to go through in order to kind of have the adoration of a you know of a big group of fans but also have the actual you know have people out to kind of get you on a weekly or maybe daily basis depending on how often you're posting it's not for everybody and i think that's okay i think you should be allowed to decide hey this isn't for me i'm gonna hang up my my, my microphone or i think the best part about this kind of era is that kids coming up nowadays can decide what kind of lane they want to go down right you can try to do a drake or you can try to do a little Uzi Vert, right? Or you can try to do like a Joey Badass, right? There are different varying levels of fame that you can basically try to attain that will allow you to have some um, hint of normalcy, some hint of privacy, some hint of like a everyday life. And it's very difficult to do. But I think it, once you reach that pinnacle, it's very difficult to sort of like pull back and and become a private figure or pull back and have some sort of level of um, decency and stuff. It's just not going to happen. You just have to... So that's why maybe a Joe Rogan maybe is the one that stands out in the fact that he is ultra famous, but still kind of maintains a level of normalcy of everyday-ishness, right? People, I'm not sure people are freaking out that much when he's in person. I'm not too sure. Maybe the way he carries himself. I'm not sure how to, how it is, is done, but it's kind of a bit gut-wrenching to see someone like a logic basically say, I just can't do it. I, I can't have people being, you know, cussing my baby or taking a piss out of my wife in public on social media, do you know what I mean? Because it's affecting the way I look at myself and how I view my family. And it's just making me, it's just bumming me out, as you said, you know, in that clip. I just thought that was a bit sad to kind of hear. But again, that's probably the real reason why he decided to pull back from social media. I mean, from um, rapping as opposed to um, the other reasons he's kind of eschewed out there. Next on the list, we have this funny one. It was really cool. This is Nicola Sturgeon, right? Um, St Scottish Prime Minister, basically telling us something we don't need to know. So I guess there's a, a certain group of people out there. I don't know what's wrong with them, but they, they've they kind of decided that it's a, it's a great annoyance that the government has decided to implement a... Um, let me pause, actually, video. Uh, people. Yeah, some people have this, some people have got decided to get angry because the government have implemented a um, overnight quarantine rule um, in place for people that are deciding to go to places like Spain, right? Because obviously they've had a bit of a spike there with COVID cases. So the government have rightfully decided, hey, if you come back from Spain, you're going to have to quarantine for 14 days. Standard, pr standard procedure, right? But I guess because they announced it in the 24-hour period when people were already flying out, those people who are due to come back soon were annoyed because it disrupted their plans. It's going to mean that they can't go to the office. They can't do certain things. I don't know, whatever the case may be, they're just annoyed by it. And it just made me think how entitled how people can be with this whole COVID situation but I was like no nah, surely that's not the case surely people don't need to be told these sort of words in it but Nicholas Sturgeon puts it in much better words than I could ever as as to how people should be treating um should be approaching their holidays during COVID right you shouldn't be approaching it like any other uh time in your life because it's not it's not the regular scheduled programming at the moment right this is a completely new world that we're living in we have to kind of navigate around it as such and uh, Nicola Sturgeon essentially excused her thoughts here in play a few now. Last week, standing here, um, I think probably this very day last week, I was very clear to people that notwithstanding what the regulations say at one point or another on different countries and whether they're in the quarantine list or, or out of it, you cannot assume that that will not change at very short notice. Um, and unfortunately, that has been borne out by the situation in Spain. But that's why I said that. You cannot assume that because a country is in, in one list when you book a holiday and go there, that it will be on that list when you come home. And that is why I continue to say to people, and I take no pleasure in saying this because of the impact on individuals and the impact on uh, industries that are very important to Scotland. But right now, be very, very cautious about booking foreign travel that is not essential because you don't know that when you're in a country, they may change uh, their regulations and so you might find yourself restricted in that country and then when you go to come home, you might find that the, the quarantine rules have changed here. But imagine having to say that. Imagine having to say that out loud and people still getting angry. That's the thing that really boggles my mind but also makes me think that there just might be a certain segment of the population that are just inherently dumb. They're just dumb people, just stupid, idiotic, um, entitled, selfish so-and-sos who just can't see past their own desires, right? And maybe it's like a manifest, maybe it's like a um, actual manifestation of that person that's, you know, like you're queuing in a store somewhere 
and then that person or maybe yeah, you're queuing on your way to go to holiday and some person gets there late in my own is thinking the way that i view things if you had a hospital if you had the hospital if you had the airport late and you're running through um immigration usually it's your own fault nine times out of ten it's your own fault you didn't sleep early enough you didn't wake up early enough you missed your alarm you you uh you cut it too close you cut it too close um to the wire and now you're basically running through every platform or every kind of building that you're in hoping to get to your gate on time that's usually your fault there are those rare occasions where the bus broke down wherever it may be but usually it's always your fault and that person is always kind of quick to ask you know hey can i jump in front because i'm late right and it's always like a bit of a kicking the teeth because like what well, so your time is more important than mine right you can decide to wake up late and i have to just let you through because i feel bad and because i don't want to look like a flipping tyrant in front of everybody else or you know so you just let them go through and i think this is basically a, f a manifestation of that right that same person who is essentially saying no i deserve a holiday because of everything that i've been going through me 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 right and then when people say okay cool go to holiday like i'm like i've always said in the beginning i don't have any problem with people going to party I don't have any problem with people going out on holiday. I have no issue. I don't have any issue with even people not wearing masks, right? But the issue that I have with it is when they start to get a bit touchy and they're a bit annoyed when they then get asked to have some level of personal responsibility, right? If you're going to go to a party and you get COVID, don't then start crying on Instagram and asking people to donate to your GoFundMe. If you're going to go on holiday and you during a global pandemic, don't then start complaining that the government last minute that come changed the rules and made it difficult for you to come back and you have all these things. Why did you go on holiday in the first place? You knew the you knew the risk. That's the issue. If you know the risk, you have to accept it. If you have to go if you go out there and you you if you want to go outside basically, you're basically trying to accept some level of risk. And those people don't really want to. And I don't really understand what it is about it. And this article here from the BBC essentially describes exactly that. And I think it went a little bit viral the other day. This girl um, was, you know, the epitome of entitlement. And I just, and I just, I'm just thankful I don't have this kind of mindset. I'm thankful it's not me. But what a, what a, what a hard thing to read. So this is from BBC. It says coronavirus. We've paid for our, our trip, so we may as well go. And it basically talks about, you know, people that have essentially booked their trips to go to Spain and they're essentially deciding to go regardless of what's happening in Spain, regardless of the spike that's happening there at the moment, right? Um, they're going to go regardless and they're going to, you know, uh, they're going to take their chances because they'd rather do that than be stuck indoors any longer. And I have paid, I have a lot of sympathy for that, right? Being stuck indoors for legitimately, what, four months plus that we've been indoors, especially if you've been abiding by the rules, right? It can drive anyone crazy, especially if you don't have your family around you, your friends aren't around you, people don't want to hang out with you. And generally, it's not as fun as it was prior to COVID to be outdoors anyway, right? Even if you go to a park, there's still a little bit of um, trepidation and anxiety in the air, right? Everyone's being a bit cautious or a bit worried, especially the parks I go to. And maybe the more hipstery ones, people don't give a fuck. But for the parks I go to, especially with families, people are still, you can still feel the tension in the air, right? No one wants to be too close to people, but people still want to get out there. So I understand but God Almighty, the entitlement in this article is insane. So if we scroll down here, I think this lady is the one that really, um, the one that kind of espouses it. This is, a, I'm entitled to travel, right? And this is a girl called uh, Shauna Lily from, or Lil, right? Shauna Lil from Sheffield. She says the following. Um, I'm excited, she said. Um, I'm a traveler and should be in a different country every single month, but I haven't been anywhere since last year boohoo right it says i think i will stick to the guidelines and wear my mask and where i have to where i have to wear them so i'm doing everything um i just feel that i have a diff i have an entitlement to travel and i will travel the travel trade association as abta and fco advice is issued for good reason and travelers need to be aware of the travel insurance um to be valid as spokesperson anyway so bitch but just imagine that quote right I'm excited I'm a traveler and I should be in a different country every single month and I haven't been anywhere since last year, okay? Just imagine saying that out loud or having that kind of way of thinking. It's just utterly bizarre to believe, you know, as, it's as if like me and you haven't been lusting to go out or abroad somewhere. We haven't been g gagging to go traveling. It's only your your needs of obviously far, sup uh, far sup supersede anybody else's needs. It's just a nutty, nutty way to look at life. But again, I have no issue with it. I think if you're willing to go out there and you're willing to pay that money to go somewhere where the virus is spiking, and especially for the people, because you should think maybe, you know when you're working in a place and someone and they say, oh yeah, um, book your Christmas holidays because there's a lot of your colleagues are, I don't know, have family outside of London or have family outside the UK. Usually you they try and give the people that have family outside the UK um, first dibs on holidays because they might need to fly out a few more days beforehand, blah, blah, blah. 
you would assume that maybe the planes would be reserved for people that actually have family abroad that haven't been able to visit them because you know maybe your family lives in italy and the virus has been ravaging you know parts of italy for the best part of three months and when it starts to kind of settle down you want to be the first person allowed or able to board the plane to go and visit your grandparents and visit your parents so you don't necessarily want to have your tickets you know sold out or taken from you because somebody decided that you need to go to venice to go see what nothing right like this should be kind of first option or first dips for people that actually need to go right as opposed to people that are just wanting to go because they don't want to be indoors anymore it's just an utterly bizarre way to look at things and again it's, it's disappointing really because you would have hoped covid would have bring would have brought out the sensible part in people and made people think you know what this is time to not be selfish to be a little bit more i don't know to be a little bit more conscious of the world I'm in and the people that I'm surrounded by, right? To be conscious of your neighbors, conscious of your community, conscious of your locale, of your city, of your town. But it's not that. If if anything, which which makes sense, because people will say the same thing, right? Money just um when you get wealth, it doesn't it doesn't change you. It just kind of amplifies who you are. So maybe the same thing's happening with COVID. It hasn't necessarily changed anybody. It's just amplified whatever bad trait you had in yourself has basically come really to the surface. And for the most part, the people that are suffering are the ones that have to kind of be subjected to this nonsense on the internet, like myself. But for the for her, fair enough. But it's just imagine saying that out loud, man. Like I will stick to the guidelines and wear my mask where I have to wear them, so I'm doing everything right. And just feel that I'm entitled to her travel, and I will travel. Jesus Christ, entitled to travel. It's just a mad phrase to say, isn't it? Like, if you've got the means to do it, fair enough. But don't say you're entitled. No one's entitled to anything, especially during COVID. You're lucky to get what we get. Especially, imagine if you lived in a, an authoritarian country like China or something, right? It wouldn't be permitted to do anything, right? And this is entitled. Like, people take their people take their freedoms for, for granted way too much, man. But hey, what can you do? Next on the list. This school is done, 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 done. So, I don't know if you guys have been following this story, but... Obviously, um, as a consequence of what's happened in America with the protests con uh, concerning police brutality in the wake of George Floyd's death, loads of different avenues, loads of different areas in society are being looked at with a magnifying glass, right? To kind of um, pick out the places where there might be institutional systemic racism or places where there are some levels of inequality, um, unfair representation and all that bloody blah, blah. And it's somehow been... And, over the last few weeks, it feels like maybe the last few months, it's found its way over to the electronic music space, right? In dance culture, especially with DJs, right? People have been getting picked apart. You know, Sarah Kin, I mentioned previously, who essentially been getting ripped for making that BPM t-shirt in poor taste and loads of other venues. Um, and the school was one of them, right? And the original story that happened from the school was basically framed around the idea that the school had purported to be this place where they were kind of um, welcoming of everybody's sexual orientation, people's race, colors, and creed they were an all welcoming place for people to, a safe haven um in the land of amsterdam where there might have been a bit of a bro chav chad sort of culture in some of the clubbing uh experiences that people had so to go to somewhere like a this school where you finally felt that like you were safe they were protected by people that looked and believed in the things that you did was great but from the people that have been, that have go there week in week out from some of the locals they were saying that that mantra or that idea that they basically espoused wasn't necessarily close to the truth and what i said was happening was that it was a place that was um, inherently inclusive um exclusive sorry a place where the security guards were accused of trying to sexually assault or in some cases they were sexually assaulting some of the patrons they're doing this weird thing that they're exchanging entry for sexual favors and this sort of no gross stuff and the most disheartening stuff about it because you know I've, as much as you should be responsible for the people that work in your company you can't be responsible for all the actions you can't be an all seeing um, all knowing eye but I guess the most disheartening fact of the story was that some of these instances were reported to people in management and they didn't really do anything about them and having listened to the podcast I did recently they did like a three hour podcast moderated by this really amazing girl who basically pressed every member of the team about the issues that were going on and they didn't really have an answer to it right this kind of you know kind of um they were kind of speaking in circles, but they didn't have any real legitimate excuse as to why they didn't make any action. And unfortunately, due to that, they've now this they've now decided to close their club. They've they've obviously cited financial reasons, but my, part of the reasons why they're closing is because of the mounting pressure online. And it just made me think about some certain things I'm going to talk about when I read this article. As I finish reading this article, sorry. So this is from Resident Advisor. It says the school announces club coach club closure club culture club closure. 
It says the Amsterdam nightclub, um, the school has announced its closing. In a statement released today, club owner Jotim, whatever his surname is, said that coronavirus pandemic made the club situation financially untenable. He said the bottom line is that the debts are piling up, he said, not only because of the under uncovered staff costs, but also um, the cost of the ongoing costs. Acting now and making this very difficult decision may prevent the total bankruptcy of our company post SC um, 11 trial. Um, he said, um, and he said uh, the bar and restaurant terrace will still be open. The announcement arrives during a turbulent time for the school. Four weeks, the club. Um, has been reacting to the range of public criticism, especially related to lack of diversity in the staff and club programming. In early June, um, local queer collective X3 moved its live stream fundraiser from Black Initiatives to Radio 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 due to the lack of action and accountability from the school. Earlier this month, a live podcast from the owner of the school and other core staff gave rise to accusation of sexual harassment by the club security. Today, the statement makes no mention of these controversies. Before today, the school plans to remain open until 2022 following an extension of its five-year at least so if you pick apart everything that's been said here right it's obvious that most of it has to do with the public outcry and it's unfortunate because i think a lot of these places that are closing down and shutting up shop due to the public outcry aren't necessarily addressing the accusations that have been levied against them and we can't necessarily have an honest conversation about what's going on because i feel like as much as there's people out there saying oh we, let's make let's stop making let's not making don't make dance music political right it should be apolitical it should be a safe haven where you should go and escape from the terrors of your everyday life unfortunately that stuff has seeped into every fabric of society whether you know whether we like it or not it's just this is the way of the game so if that's the case we have to put our best foot forward and try to somehow remedy that and i in my opinion i think club culture is unique in that respect because we can if we want to collectively create or construct our own little utopia in the same way that bar 25 right that legendary berlin bar berlin um, nightclub from back in the day was essentially like this kind of safe haven for all these freaks and geeks um in berlin at, at a certain time and if you listen to people that speak about that place right they speak about it in terms where you've never heard anyone speak about a nightclub ever before in the same way some person will speak about maybe the early days of Bergheim, right so there is something that you can do in the industry in the scene to cultivate that kind of um you know the sort of ideals that you would like politics to kind of espouse which you can't necessarily change because there's so many levels of politics to get through so much red tape it's hard to kind of make any kind of meaningful change but we can make change in our own way especially in our club spaces whether it's addressing the lack of diversity in our lineups whether it is making sure we create actual safe spaces and we get people in there that can actually police these places in a good and proper way whether it's kind of highlighting different you know musical influences and kind of providing the platform to kind of spread that message to a different client base whatever it may be we can do it ourselves and i think just shutting your doors and kind of running away from the problem doesn't necessarily help the issue then on the other side of it i think if you're the techno twitter lot that's kind of badgering people to kind of uh bend at the knee and to kind of conform to your idea of what you think clubbing should be like you should also be very willing and very willing really willing and able to offer your own solution and i think that's maybe part of the problem so the people that are complaining have legitimate issues, but they're complaining and not doing anything about it. They're not opening their own clubs. They're not opening their, they're not starting their own kind of, I don't know, agencies, management companies, consultancy groups, nothing. Just complaining on social media and kind of, you know, cropping people's pictures, posting them up, um, getting at them, attacking them, calling them, you know, saying some really derogatory words to them and essentially just being mean, which doesn't necessarily make people um, you know, I don't necessarily agree with that level of confrontation is going to, you know, um, anything positive is going to come out of it. That person's just going to be this defensive. They're going to have their back against the wall. They're going to want to defend their position. And we're just not going to have any kind of meaningful resolution from it. So it's a two, it's a two fact uh, kind of issue to solve, right? On the, the, on, on the side of people that kind of quote unquote hold all the power, they need to be receptive and willing to listen to the issues that are going on and kind of implement some level of some level of change in the way they, they do business but then on the side of the protesters they also need to understand that if you're going to have so much to say about these issues you need to have a solution yourself you need to build something of your own and it feels like we're in this world at the moment now where there's more value in complaining and in whining about issues as there is about sorting them out and again politics and stuff leave it to one side politics is you know it's a whole 
quagmire to sort out. That's a really complex issue. That's something that needs to be dealt with on so many levels that it's not even worth even me talking about. But in club culture, we can sort that out ourselves. We can definitely rectify the solution. We can definitely kind of readjust the balances. And part of me thinks there's going to be a solution anyway. I, I kind of think my kind of hope or my kind of... Yeah, my hope is that once COVID is over, you're going to see some of the bigger clubs, like let's say the Bergheims, the Fabrics, they're just going to address the issue without even saying much about it. They might just start doing 50-50 gender split lineups. They might just having, you know, certain nights dedicated to representing, you know, uh, minority groups, whatever it may be. I think they're just going to do it. And then all the other... Um, all the other promoters, all the other clubs around the world are just going to follow suit and copy whatever they're doing. Because, you know, like it or not, you know, we do live in a copycat industry. Whatever works monetarily for these clubs, they're just going to copy, rinse and repeat. But it would be good to have a, an actual conversation about this that didn't turn into kind of slinging matches and people essentially having their businesses closed because they couldn't handle the pressure. But I don't know, man. I don't know. That's basically why I, I, I land on it. I think there needs to be some level of me mediation. People need to just meet each other in the middle in both in both camps so that we can come to some sort of good solution because at the moment this sort of like infighting is not really helping out anybody in my opinion but anyway RIP the scored I really wanted to go there I've never actually got a chance to check it out it looked like a cool space um, they really in my opinion has some pretty interesting programming but unfortunately it's gone RIP and hopefully some lessons can be learned from it some clubs can see what happened wrong and right there and kind of implement those changes need to be done and the ones protesting can also be a little bit more helpful in terms of helping them to kind of figure it out maybe they did right maybe they did maybe i'm completely wrong and these activists online did actually offer to help out and the, the school people just completely ignored them but i want to see some level of actionable change some kind of a uh, kind of blueprints five-point plan as to how um clubs can um implement can kind of can be a bit more representative of the people that go to their club as opposed to just pillaring them and telling them to kind of bend at their knee that's not basically the right way to go about things but again what do i know Next on the list, what do we have here? We're rattling through the topics, man. Rattling through them. What else we got through the... Oh, let's talk about this one. A little bit. Barcelona Sports Drama. So Barcelona Sports had a bit of drama the other, I think, a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, because the main guy, El Presidente de Porno, decided to go and sit down with the President of the United States, Donald Trump. And of course, that, you know, um, was you, naturally you'd know it's going to cause a reaction uh, but unfortunately it caused a reaction with his own staff members um, more importantly Big Cat from KFC Radio who is essentially one of the kind of founding members of uh, Barcelona Sports in its current iteration was essentially kind of put out a bit by it because he felt as if he wasn't consulted by it he felt as if like no one addressed him no one kind of um, wanted to seek out his counsel regarding the issue he made him question everything that's going on in Barstool so this is a video that kind of describes everything that's going on I'm going to quickly play it and then I'm going to give you my thoughts on the other side go, go, go. come on play my computer's loading 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 got too many tabs open as per usual this is a standard para course but I'm why so don't be surprised so this is from big cat radio on barstool sports gonna play it here for you now that's just stating a fact from my perspective like i i, I watched the video so i watched it twice this morning there were no hard questions there were no you know follow-up if you're going to go interview the president, you have to have that ready to go. You can't let it become uh, a political act. And so the other part of it is I don't think it's a, a, a mis uh, coincidence that the president's office reached out to Barstool four months before an election when he's polling at his worst spot. Again, I don't want to talk about politics, but I'm forced to right now because this is, the, this is what now – Barstool has become, and I'm going to get to all that in a second because that's the bigger point. But I don't think it's a coincidence that we were offered this at this specific point in time. And that uh, bothers me because it feels like we're being used in a political race. And I, from day one, I've always thought that what we do here is make people laugh and we don't get into politics. We don't get into politics and we don't get into politics. In fact, two months ago, you know, w uh, someone reached out to, to PFT and I to, to possibly interview Joe Biden. We said no. I said no. I said I'm not going to do it. I do not get into politics. People come to, to, to listen to me for an escape from the real world. I'm here to make them laugh. I don't want to be serious. That's just what I want to provide for my audience. And that's what Barstool should provide to our audience. Now we're at a crossroads because I don't really understand where we land. 
Um, but the bigger issue and uh, the part that is really like killing me to my core this morning is that I wasn't made aware whatsoever that this was happening. And I found out on Twitter and via text message just like everyone else. And you may say to yourself, that's not a big deal. But I'll give you a little backstory of why it hurts and why, for the first time ever, I'm saying to myself, what am I doing? Like, what am I doing? Because in December 2019, I sat down with Dave, Erica, Jay Snowden, Penn CEO. And the deal was getting decided, and we were putting everything together. And they all three of them looked me in my eye and said, you are a key part of this. It's actually written down. It's not like, oh, like we, you, we think you're important. It was written down. You are a key part of this deal. Like, this deal doesn't happen without you, Dan. Look me in the eye. I said, you are a partner in this. You are a partner what we're building. So flash forward to yesterday. I find out on Twitter. I text Eric. I text Dave. I text everyone what's going on. I have no idea. Uh, I then talk to them. So Dave found out that he had the opportunity to interview the president on Wednesday. He talked to Erica. He talked to Churning Group. He talked to Jay. He didn't talk to me. So he just blatantly said, I do not care what Dan thinks about this. Which, again, interesting, right? Because I'm not going to play the whole clip. I've already played a lot already there. But um, so I guess part of the part of the issue or part of the illuminating thing of this is it kind of reminds me again a little bit of what happened with me uh, when i was used to work at nike right because there is that how to say you you sometimes you you're you have a reason to feel like you're included and you're part of the story especially when you start really during the infancy of a company's you know formation right when you're starting when it's just yeah when you when you when, when you start working for a company that's just getting started it can feel as if like you are part of it, that you're kind of forming it, that you're integral to its kind of forward momentum and where it's kind of going. And you maybe have, you might have some really demonstrable um, evidence to show that, right? Look, I did this and this, this helped to get this and that. You, I, I'm sure that could be true. But for the most part, I've always kind of had it in the back of my head that, hey, I'm just a hired gun. I'm just an employee here. There's no um, sense of ownership at all because I didn't invent this thing. This thing was made by Bill Bowerman, you know, however many years ago and Phil Knight back in the day i'm just a guy that just happened to kind of tag along you know when it went all successful and big and i can't really assume that i have any kind of real ownership in it but even myself somebody i think i feel as if i'm quite sensible and rational when it comes to these sort of things even i got swept up in this idea that oh i'm one of the founding members i must be integral to this place success and when that nike situation for me came tumbling down and we it's I essentially got let go before everybody else when I was one of the first people there for no apparent reason apart from just not being one of the more likable ones in the group or maybe not being the one that had maybe the more connections or maybe not being the one that was more agreeable or whatever reason, right? Whatever reasons they have, whether legitimate or illegitimate, it doesn't matter. That's kind of war under the bridge. But I remember the time thinking, wow, man, how could that happen to me? I was one of the founding members. But then you think about it when you kind of pull back a bit, you're like, no, you weren't really. You were just a kind of, you were maybe told you were, you may be kind of given the assumption that maybe you were kind of one of the people kind of of uh, spearheading where this place was going to go in the future but really and truly you just played a, your role your, you played a role when you were given the opportunity and maybe you didn't play the game well enough to kind of allow yourself some man space to maneuver and pivot into another situation that could kind of you know because i didn't maybe use the clout of that job well as i should have but i understand his pain because i understand because and again you have to assume it's probably harder at Barstool because, you know, Dave Pointer is intrinsically linked to Barstool Sports, right? He is Barstool Sports. So sometimes, even though he has a, he, every legitimate reason to go interview the president, because he represents Barstool Sports, it does look like a Barstool Sports thing. And because he goes president and, and not, not everyone in the company is going to agree with sitting down with the, with the president, right? Because he's so divisive as a figure, regardless of what you think. Um, I still I still kind of have the belief that you should sit down with all presidents, right? Regardless if you like them or not. It's a bit of a rare... You should either sit down with all of them or none of them. That's where I kind of sit. You should you should have... Yeah, you should, that's where you should be. It's like um, it's like the... On, it's like the honours list in the UK, right? 
you don't accept an MBE just because you like the Queen. You you don't accept it or don't expect it because of what you think of the British Empire, right? That is how it should be. And I think maybe it should same thing should be with the presidency. But I think all those people that were clamoring to get into the White House when Barack Obama were there, for them to suddenly kind of you know turn their nose up at going to see Trump in the White House is a little bit offensive to the office, in my opinion. Again, just from a British dude from the outside, I don't know what is going on over there, but that's what I kind of think. So you should be either in or out. But I also understand if you're a Barcelona sports employee seeing your boss. Um, sit down with Trump when you don't, you know, when you have no word or no say in it, or when it represents your company, it can be put your nose a bit bent. But unfortunately, what I was trying to get to was that it's his company. He runs it. He can do whatever he pleases. And I think that's something that you have to kind of come to the conclusion of when you're working in a big brand and you have a bit of clout and you have your own little platform. You can sometimes feel as if, even if you are somebody like a big cat who is kind of, you know, a bit more, he's more of a fixture at Barstool Sports than I was at Nike ever. Don't get me wrong, I'm not comparing us. But ultimately, you are working for somebody. And until you're not working for somebody, you have your own platform, you're never going to agree with everything they do. And they might do some things that they're never going to consider you for in the conversation because it's their right because it's their company um and that's kind of the unfortunate truth but again hope they sort it out because i'm a big fan of Boston sports i'm a big fan of dave um i i do think he can be a bit of a fame whore and i think that is essentially why he gets himself roped into some sticky situations i think he's he kind of reminds me of adam 22 from no jumper they're so they're both very cognitive or very very aware of what viral of, of viral moments right they're very aware of kind of you know online marketing and kind of getting about on social media it can sometimes land them in hot bother but it is what it is isn't it but unfortunately if you work for those two guys if you're if you're an employee at no jumper if you're an employee at Barcelona sports he's just going to have to kind of ride the good times or the bad, isn't it? He might do some stuff that you agree with and he might do some stuff that you don't agree with. It is what it is, really. And nothing else you can do. But I thought that was interesting to talk about. Next on the list. But ragging through them, what else do we have to talk about here? Da, 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 da. Oh, this is a good one. So, Hidden NY, this Instagram page, I'm sure you guys are familiar with. I'm, right? I'm sure you guys are familiar with. Hidden NY, it's like the... I'd say the number one streetwear sneaker sort of um what instagram mood board blog things right maybe it's taken over that that little jupiter guy because i think he got his account banned a couple of times but from for if you if your aesthetic is kind of streetwear and trainers i think the number one place that you're going to kind of follow is um heading and white i've got it here on the screen um so they have you know standard stuff loads of jordans loads of rappers cars expensive watches you know that kind of side of streetwear that i'm not really a fan of right which is essentially all those guys that used to wear high-end fashion who are now wearing streetwear but you know it still serves some sort of purpose you still see some great archival images of brands and stuff that you kind of like he obviously slips in some stuff of his own in terms of the socks that he does and hats and caps and stuff and blah 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 anyway so this guy was recently featured on a podcast called hidden fits no, Throwing Fits, sorry, Hidden Fits. That's probably a good uh, merger podcast name. And he essentially spoke about um, how he formed a relationship with Drake. Uh, Drake was obviously a big proponent, a big follower, a big fan of Hidden NY. Um, I, I think they basically put him onto Chrome Hearts, it feels like, or maybe Bari. I'm not sure why, but he's always wearing Chrome Hearts at the moment. There's a picture going around of Virgil now at the moment wearing a Chrome Hearts, you know, headband, which is just preposterous to say the least. And it reminds me of uh, peak Joe Budden uh, Fitz era, right? It's just completely horrible outfit. And he's essentially, even though I like his music, he is essentially single handedly killed, you know. Uh, he's essentially killed um chrome hearts him alongside a rich the kid probably have essentially destroyed it. even gunner they don't really wear it the right not right way but they've essentially ripped it to pieces they've taken any kind of legitimacy that came came out of it and essentially killed it by over buying things is that a thing can you over purchase stuff well regardless right he basically spoke about his relationship with drake and if anything this conversation basically um was a reminder as to why some people hate some aspects of the streetwear industry and why there's a definite split and a different divide in terms of the different camps that occupy this world that is streetwear. There's different areas of it. And I just don't want to be involved in anything that has to do with whatever this guy was talking about in streetwear, right? And I'm going to play it for you now. It was a clip that I saw on Twitter concerning the whole entire thing. Da, 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 da. Let me get on here. Come on, load up, load up, load up, load up. Okay, here's this is the guy from, from Hidden... And why talking about his relationship with Drake? I, he, he hit me up and he was like, "Yo, send me something to buy." That's like <laughs> all he said. So I made like a word document. I was like, oh, "I'm going to impress him." I, I made this word document and it had I put all the pictures and there was forty links maybe of all the 
you know you could do that thing on ground where you you uh you refine the search and yeah filters the most popular and, shit, yeah, and stuff like that so yeah. i put in his sizes did that and i picked out basically some of the most expensive just ridiculous things that that sit on there for a long time you know they sit on ground these these crazy items and uh and i sent him through and he just bought all of it and i was like oh my god he's buying like everything i could ever want it's it, i was getting like like a little bit of the, the taste of how it is to buy all this stuff. So I just you were you were ga- you were gassed off the vapors. I believe I was gassed. I was gassed. I was like, what oh was the God. total? What was it? What was the total damage from just that first haul? Fifty k, sixty k. Yeah, light work. The yeah, light work light for work Drizzy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah, like Drizzy. Drake had like a f- Drake Drake and Hidden uh, actually had like a four or five week run where the most expensive item sold on Grail <laughs> yeah, like yeah. in any week. Flip a coin. Drake is definitely in the top ten, but it but that top he was top three like like that's a back to back to back to back championship yeah, yeah, yeah. run, dude. It was yeah. ridiculous. What yeah. um he was going crazy with it. He, yeah, he was. He has a lot of stuff. I got to say, he sends some pictures of his wardrobe and stuff. He has a lot of stuff. Cringe, right? Super super cringe, right? Incredibly cringe. So awful that it's it kind of beggars belief. But hey, let's go through it. So um. The most kind of telling thing that kind of came out of this, right, was it's basically, um, you know how people take the piss out of these little kids that are high beasts that just buy anything that's expensive? This is this same sort of kind of um, buying behavior or this kind of uh, pers- this kind of approach to fashion also applies to the guys who are a bit older and have a bit more disposable income. They're doing exactly the same things. They're just buying whatever is expensive whatever is quote unquote rare because it's expensive and then whacking it on with no sense of style, no sense of appreciation. That's kind of the really worrying part about that story is the fact that he, that the guy himself who Drake asked to, oh, give, give me a list. Fair enough. Let's take Drake out of the equation, right? Let's say he's a bit of a dork and he doesn't know necessarily how to dress that well. He doesn't really have any personal style, which I think is really annoying because I think he looks really great when he wears tracksuits and sportswear type clothing but whenever he tries to get to his fashion bag he always look, comes across a bit too try hard but put him to one side right because I think when you're as rich as he is you're allowed to make some um, incorrect decisions in terms of how you put your outfits together because you just got too much access to stuff sometimes the having a lack of means of buying things actually makes you have a better sense of style because you only have a certain amount of stuff to kind of choose from right so put him to one side the issue is that that grailed guy when he gets to, when he gets requests when he's requested by somebody who has means to put together a list of items that could suit his wardrobe instead of thinking about drake as an artist and what his style is and what he kind of wears and kind of asking him some questions and having kind of i don't know a stylist appointment right a personal shopper's appointment with him some back and forth he instead goes on to grailed and just sorts by clothing size and expensiveness right by price basically and picks out the most rarest things and gives that to him instead when it has nothing to do with his personal style just go oh, let's pick that let's pick that let's pick, let's pick this out what there's no there's no understanding of the history of the brand how that ties into his story as a musician the 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 kind of era that kind of clothing was birthed from the design influences the political climate it's just nothing that you would think that would actually be such an easy win this is and again i'm not saying these things to sound smart these are just easy wins that would just kind of add a bit more of legitimacy to what's going on he could have gone on grailed and picked out some undercover underground canadian brand that people don't really know about maybe the designer of this head label was uh uh, an ex-Toronto person, bloody blood. Maybe this brand could tie win at the European house, considering his new single we put out with Khalid called um, Greece. I don't know. So many weird connections that you could have put together when you put that list together that would have really made a bit, added a bit more um, substance to it. But instead, he just picks out the most expensive stuff, gives it to him, and then now we're left with a page essentially that's been used as what a weird quasi mood board for Drake and people of his liking. It's like, God damn, no wonder it's so terrible. No wonder. No wonder it's so terrible. Um, and then it comes down to, and then, and then the lack of style thing is a big thing, right? I've written on here. The lack of style is a big thing because that's the main issue I have with most of these kids is that, you know, you, you're free to buy what you want. But if what you're buying is just based on the price tag and based on what you've seen ASAP Rocky wearing with no correlation to what you're actually into yourself, it really makes you question um your kind of frame your kind of the way your mind works right that you're so willing and able because i always thought that was weird personally people that dress up like people like there's, there's that kid going around at the moment who kind of has that tiktok where he basically dresses up like playboy Carty, and i've always thought that's super bizarre why you purposely want to look like somebody else is really odd but it also makes me think like don't you have any sense of uh, your own personal style that you're trying to kind of flex and get out there now again i know it's difficult to do 
it's very difficult to find your personal style. It's very difficult to kind of land on something that works for yourself. But it does take a bit of homework. It does take a bit of exploration, a bit of patience to kind of fumble the bag a few times to buy a few things that are incorrect, don't really fit what you wear, don't really fit your body type or whatever it may be. But it's a far better journey than just... I don't know, deciding to copy and paste whatever Lou Uzi Vert's wearing or whatever Rich the Kid's wearing because that is just devoid of any kind of real interrogation, real kind of self-reflection as to what you're actually into and who you want to support. Um, continuously, I said, um, the death of Chrome Hearts. Yeah, again, I'm not even that big of a Chrome Hearts fan. I've, I saw, I used to see it all the time when I, you know, there's these Japanese magazines that I have down here somewhere, right? Like this stuff, right? Like these magazines and the boons and all that stuff, right? They they always feature stuff like um Chrome Hearts and Goros and all that sort of jewelry. And I never was a big fan of it. I didn't really care for it too much, right? But I appreciate what the kind of references. I appreciate the authenticity of it, and I appreciate the fact that there were some people out there that really, really gave a shit about it and wore it in a very tasteful and kind of stylish way, right? It just kind of it just always seemed effortless. Then out of the blue, I don't know if it was purposely their own kind of drive in order to kind of make sure that they kind of evolve into the next stage, but it's suddenly gone turn into i don't know the modern era of von dutch i don't know how why it happened overnight so quickly and it seems like it's gone it's gone far beyond being cool anymore it's just become you know whatever it's sort of like you know when vlon happened the same sort of thing vlon had a, a little time period where it was pretty um aspirational in his own way right don't get me wrong it's all printed on gildans all that sort of shit i get it i get it, I get it. but there was a time when vlon had its moment and then quite quickly it just evaporated and just went somewhere else right and same thing's happening with chrome hearts but they have a much longer history in the game doing their own thing beating to the um moving to the sound of their own drum right that suddenly now for them to kind of um play into what's going on at the moment now in general it feels a bit weird and again maybe it's because they've had a change in management or they just wanted to evolve the brand anyway and they weren't making that much money but the death of chrome hearts is real right if you're a real chrome hearts fan from back in the day even just from the beginning of the 2000s to see what it's kind of turned into now must make you like yeah what the hell is this man rappers covering all their jeans with the chrome hearts cross regardless of what if it looks good or not buying the most ridiculous items from there just to flex on people the headband is like all right cool man um and then Da, 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 da. oh and then i also heard that this kind of reminded me a little bit also of that why i hate the that youtube channel where all that kid goes around and asks people how much their outfits are it's like if if ever there was something that represented the, um, the complete antithesis or the complete opposite of what the values of streetwear should be about is that right going around asking people how much they're spending on the outfit is like irrelevant Right? It shouldn't matter because streetwear has never been about how much a certain item is or how much you paid for it. It's always about things that kind of spoke to you in a real personal way. Things that kind of resonate with you far beyond just what it was printed on, right? Whether it was the owners of the brand, whether it was the messaging behind it, whether it was the vibe. Part of the reason why Supreme was so successful was because of the whole vibe around it, right? It wasn't necessarily about the clothes. The clothes were shit. I think even Jim Jim, Jim Trevia said at the beginning when he started Supreme, he just started it because essentially like, you know, the skateboarders had really great sense of style, but the clothes that they were buying at the time was garbage. So he just wanted to up the levels a bit. That was it. And some of the earlier clothings or some of the other earlier pieces Supreme did, especially if you buy some of the earlier t-shirts, they were printed on basic blanks. They were printed on basic blank t-shirts, hoodies. They were basically um, co-opted um, jackets as well. I remember the, that st standard bought kind of windbreakers from shops that he basically tabbed the logo on and then over time they kind of evolved into a full quote-unquote cut and sew brand but most of the reason why it was a it was appealing was because of that right some of the best skateboard brands that start off especially some i don't know i think of some of the brands that start off doing bearings or wheels and stuff just hardware it's basically because of the vibe diamond supply might be a good example of that right that hoodie represent or that t-shirt that logo was more then what it was the more than it was worth more than some of its parts really right it was about everything that nick kind of built around it the world that kind of got you in you know infatuated with that brand especially during its infancy so for people to go around tr buying things based on their price value and then thinking they're gonna get any kind of value from it, it's gonna add to their sense of style it's gonna make them a better person it's just like then the next man is just awful and the brand's playing into it releasing things in hyper limited uh, numbers pricing things far out of the range of your average everyday person it's just all disgusting it really is and <clears throat> i don't know i don't know what, what the future is for this but 
I don't live one. I don't want to live in a world where you're just buying things based on the money you have in your bank account. You should be able to, especially nowadays, man, like experimenting with different styles and trying things out that really work with you or not. It's so much fun trying to figure out what is your style. And it's a never ending journey, really, right? If you sort of keep on refining it again and again and again, I thought, I thought maybe these kids haven't grown up with, you know, um, perusing uh, street blogs and i don't know street style blogs or looking at people that were you know arriving especially during the early days of like the um, the sartorius blog where he was picking pay, pay pictures of people at petty Uma and all those milan fashion weeks and some of these guys you'd see effortlessly cool and sophisticated cool. outfits and stuff that i probably wouldn't necessarily wear i wouldn't necessarily match my personal style but a lot of it had to do with these guys have had a long and storied history of essentially spending dedicating their whole entire life to discovering or finding out exactly what they like and what they don't like right and it's kind of all been illustrated through the stuff that they buy and they've kind of dedicated life to it. even sometimes some of the people that are obsessed with was it was it the kotaku kind of culture in japan right um, is it Kotaku? It's called Kotaku, isn't it, right? When you're obsessive, obsessive about collecting certain things or when you're involved in the streetwear industry that they're involved in over there, it's more so than about just looking like a certain person. It's always about kind of picking up things that work with you, um, picking up brands that really resonate with you and sort of just sticking with them for the long haul and really kind of framing your personal style around that. But kids these days, man, God almighty, buying anything just because it's expensive is like, whew, could have been me, could have been me. Anyway, let's check on English episode number what? three four seven i think right thanks so much for tuning in as per usual if you liked what you're hearing and you want to support the show make sure you support me on patreon the patreon link will be down below it's patreon.com forward slash agostino that's patreon.com forward slash a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o all one word make sure you support me on there for as low as one dollar a month and you can get access early access to all my all my audio shows on there before they come out anywhere else and of course if you want to follow me on socials make sure you do that too links to my social medias all down below and of course if you're watching via the youtube smash that like button hit subscribe and leave me a comment comment down below but until then take care be safe everybody peace